Right, good evening everybody. My name is um, Andy Kinnear. I am the um, programme director for a piece of work um, called Connecting Care, a programme I'm going to sort of describe and talk through um, this evening. But before I do that, can I just ask, does everybody recognise that? Do you know what that is? Hands up if you know it. Some of you work for it. Okay, good. So that in, um, in NHS comms terms is described as the NHS lozenge. It's actually the brand. It's the, it's the little logo that appears everywhere you go when you interact and work with uh, and go and visit um, health services. But in reality, these are the organisations that are providing health and social care across Bristol. So on that slide are 17 different organisation names who are all responsible for health and social care in this, in this sort of greater city area. And actually, with, within each of those organisations, they are capturing and collecting information on the patients and the citizens that they look after in, in different systems, often in very many different systems in each of those organisations. And so, um, what Connecting Care is, Connecting Care is a programme to enable us to bring together that information that's been collected in all of those different areas into, into one place in effect, to allow the clinical professionals, the doctors, the nurses, the social care workers to access the information they need to, to, to be able to provide the best possible care for the person they've got in front of them. So um, you may be surprised to learn that at the moment if you go into hospital, very often typically the doctors will not have access to, the, to your full GP record there and then as they as they, as they try and provide your care, or likewise, when you're discharged from hospital, the GP might not have access to all of the information that was collected on you while you were in hospital. So these are, these are the kind of things that very often the public, when they see that NHS logo, um, they actually believe all of this information is all joined up and somehow the health service has got, got, got one kind of great super record of, of all of your information and therefore can, can, therefore can provide that care, and that's just not the case. And so what we're working on in this programme is to, is to bring that about. And so the drivers are, are twofold, really. There are, um, there are local drivers. So these are direct quotes from, um, from doctors, from nurses, from social care professionals in our community who are describing the fact that not having access to that information actually hinders their ability to do their jobs, hinders their ability to um, provide the best possible care. And so those are very much the sort of local drivers, the sort of stories that, that, that we're picking up locally. And then at a national level, there are, there are two pictures, I guess, that emerge. One, one is around um, uh, the Caldicott Review, so those reviews into what we should be doing with information for the, better, uh, for the betterment of, of care. And so um, the, the Caldicott 2 Review talks about a duty to share that information. That's exactly what we've got within health and social care now. Um, so that is a, a, a national... Um, expectation and then we've had some um, fairly high profile serious case reviews um, in health and social care over the years including one um, very local and very recent um, to do with Winterbourne View and actually the, the, the conclusions of those are repeatedly that the agencies involved in the care of the individuals should be sharing the information better or if they had shared that information better I should say then they would have been in a position to provide better care and a lot of you may remember the um, really tragic case of Victoria Columbia and the Lord Lehman report that followed that described this you know, poor young girl who was um, mistreated terribly by her family and actually had been into contact with, with health and with social care on repeated occasions prior to, her, pr prior to her death and just actually those connections had not been made. So those are the kind of national drivers. Um, on top of that, we, we in the health service have got a five-year view. Um, the chap in the middle of that picture, um, uh, some of you may recognise a guy called Simon Stevens. He is the new head of the health service, been in post uh, a few months now. He's the guy that's telling the government to give us eight billion more or else. Um, so he's quite a brave man. Um, and actually he's, he's written a five year view for, for health and social care. And within it, um, for the first time ever, I think, there's a real determination to um, put interoperability between those clinical and care systems um, front and center. So, so that's the kind of national drivers. So the who and the what. So again, same organisations, Connecting Care is made up of all of those 17 partners. So uh, UHB, the BRI, all of those guys are in. North Bristol, Southmead, they're all in. All of our community services are in. Social care departments, they're all in. All of the GPs, 110 practices, they're all in. Um, so, you know, you name it, they're in. So it's kind of, we're, we're, we're joining everybody together in that sense. And then this one, so this is the, this is the one slightly technical slide. So for the 
for the technical architects in the audience, you know, fill your boots now. This is where you enjoy yourselves. For the, for the normal people, just grit your teeth and I'll spend as little time on this one as I possibly can. Um, but in essence, what this is describing is where we've got to so far. So along the bottom of that slide, you can see the systems that we've already joined in. So there are three acute um, PAS systems, North Bristol Trust, Western and UHB are the three um, acute hospital trusts. So we've joined them together. We've then joined um, four Rio systems. So they are our community nursing, district nursing, health visits in those sort of services, um, as well as the mental health trust system is a Rio um, product. Um, Adastra for end of life and out of hours. So um, you'll be aware if you need to access your GP out of hours, so overnight or, or through the weekend, you might contact an out of hours service. Those guys use the Adastra system. That's where they collect your information. So they're connected in. Um, to this system. Orders and results, um, so this links in, this is our pathology systems, tests, um, diagnostics, all of that information. And then just to the right there you see Paris uh, and Swift, those are two social care systems, so they are adult social care records that are also being shared within this piece. This diagram will get ever more complicated and when I do this talk a year from now there'll be 15 more systems joined across that bottom and we'll be describing. Then you can see off to the right, um, the GPs, so all the GP records, they come in through a slightly different mechanism, which is why they're, uh, they're, 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 they're sort of displayed in the way they're displayed. There's a whole bunch of middle stuff. I'm not going to go into any detail unless anybody really desperately wants to understand the, the, the technical architecture of that centre section, but in, it, in essence, it's an integration engine um, mix that joins it all together. And then at the top layer, we have the portal itself. So this is the system that people, users, doctors, so on, access day in, day out to, to view that. Um, to view that shared record um, and as well as the presentation layer obviously we've got um, quite a sophisticated um, uh, consent model and, and sort of information governance protection layer that sits within there to make sure that only the appropriate people access your record they only access the parts of their record that are legitimately allowed to their own their relationship with that record only lasts for a fixed amount of time um, so very short in A&E, a bit longer if you're a GP for example um, so that all of that protection there sits in um, that piece and this is live now this exists this is actually um, running in Bristol there are about 600 users currently um, operating across the, the the city and then South Gloucestershire and North Somerset as well um, our plans are to take this up to about 4,000 um, by the end of this year and then ramp up by 2,000 a year up to eventually 10,000 um, health and social care professionals using this sort of three years hence by which time the record will be ten times richer obviously because we will have added in um, lots more systems and so in terms of the information that's, uh, that's in there, you start to get a gist of um, the various elements, the demographics, the, 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 the sort of um, diagnostic details, the, the medications and um, the various things like that. And then off to the, to the right, you can start to see the, the elements that we're, we're building in. So the growth for this program um, uh, for the next year or so grows in a number of ways. The user base increases, the number of systems we attach increases, and the richness of the record that we, um, that we share increases as well. And then some of the benefits, so at the moment, these are the, the 600 people I talked about are um, particular professional groups. They're, they're largely gathered around the, what we call the urgent care pathway. So this is A&E, typically, or, or, or kind of out-of-hours services that are involved in the treatment of, um, of people who need urgent care. And they've been selected um, specifically to allow us to measure the benefits of this piece of work. So believe it or not, when we start um, a project like this, there's not... Uh, universal belief that this would be a great thing to do and actually we've had to sort of go and develop uh, a business case for investment in the next stage of that and so measuring the benefits of, as we've gone along has been a, a really critical part of that and we've used the urgent care um, the, the pathway um, that spans urgent care as the, as the basis for for measuring that and so what we're starting to see is is some really um, some really interesting benefits so some really hard measured you know, factual, you know, the kind of kind of thing your finance director quite likes, um, the stuff that talks about saving time, saving effort, um, if, you know, driving up efficiency, you can see those um, sort of things. There's, a, there's a, uh, a rather interesting row in there where it says saves installation and equipment costs under social care. That actually relates to 
um, a reduction in the number of toilets uh, our Bristol City Council are having to install downstairs in people's houses because now they've got access to um, the, the full care record. They can see for some individuals that they scheduled building works at their homes for um, were no longer necessary because these people were going to be um, you know, going into a nursing home or whatever, were going into a different path and so they've been able to cancel estates works in people's houses and are actually saving money. Um, I have to say up front that the original business case for this work was not built on us building less toilets. Um, but that's been, a, that's been a happy byproduct of this piece of work. Um, and actually, as, as we've gone along, we're, we're finding benefits that we, that we hadn't imagined. So again, you see um, in out of hours and in pharmacy and things like that, there's a whole um, suite of benefits that have been realized that are, that are hard measured stuff. And then on top of that, there's, um, I think I've got my near, yeah. On top of that, there are um, anecdotal sort of professional stories type benefits that are coming out of this. So. Um, clinical care professionals who are coming forward to say actually my job's better because of this. Um, I spoke to a pharmacist uh, recently at UHB, at the, at the BRI, who um, actually says her, her professional standing with her colleagues is increased thanks to this system because previously she could describe a little bit about the medication the patient was on but it would be relatively limited. Now she can get into the GP record, she can go and see all of the other people that have prescribed to that patient, she can provide an actual, a much richer picture of the uh, of the medical history, uh, the you know, medication history rather of the patient and actually her professional standing with her colleagues has increased. Now that wasn't, again, it's not a benefit you it's hard to measure, um, but given you know the morale challenge we often have in the health service, that's quite a nice thing to be to be delivering. You can start to see there these are you know these are quotes from um, from from some of the um, professionals we've got in our community as they um, use this piece. So so far so good. We're about um, three years into this work really from when it properly kicked off. Um, I, I'm, I'm imagining this is a you know six or seven year piece of work at the very minimum and may well go on way beyond that. Um, I can see that we will get into some really interesting space as we go forward and begin to make these things, uh, this record mobile and allow folks to access it on the move. Um, there's a place on this journey where patients will access this record. So nationally there is work going underway at the moment to develop what's called the personal health record. Um, some of you who follow this stuff, you'll see Apple um, and all the health kit development that they've done. This is, this is kind of enabling all of us to start um, collecting our own um, health records and um, develop the ability for your Fitbit or whatever it is to sort of connect your, your, your heart rate to your, to your personal health record to then connect it to this record. So th there's an agenda that goes way beyond just the professional facing um, piece of this work, but you'll, um, you'll appreciate this. This is, this is a, s a significant achievement from where we are. Um, and so in terms of where we're at, um, I think this is, a, this is what I'd probably describe as a damn good start. It's clearly not um, a finished piece of work. Um, I think it is worth saying, and this is just a rah-rah Bristol moment, that, that this work is, is some way ahead of most other communities in the country. Um, we, we've been announced as one of the national exemplar um, sites for, for this work. I think um, partially because of the technical achievement of actually bringing this record together and partially because we've managed to keep 17 organisations in a room without them falling out um, for three years, which is uh, you know, no mean achievement itself. And actually, if you, if you were to trot around the country and speak to folks, you'd find they're all kicking off um, bits of this work, you know, so it's, it's, it's happening in, in, in lots of communities and we've got the advantage of being um, slightly ahead of that game. And um, that photograph at the bottom is um, Sir Bruce Keogh, the NHS medical director, recently visited South Mid, I think, um, at the end of last year, just to sort of, you know, do a kind of bit of a rah-rah, well done you, um, seeing the kind of connecting care team in that point. And that is where I'm going to stop. Have I got time to invite any questions, David? Or yes, I think so. Just the one that the right in which case... I have got another 20 slides that I've hidden behind the thank you. <laughs> I kid you not, they are there if we need them. I, they sometimes help. So has anybody got any questions? Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, did it fail terribly? Well, did it? I'll, 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 I'll deal with that in my answer. Yes. So the question was, um, was, was there previously a national program, in effect, to deliver this um, piece of work, and did it fail terribly? Um, if you read the Daily Mail, it did, I think, is probably the, uh, the short answer to that. Um, yes, yeah, yes the, the answer is yes. There was a national program for, for IT, for the health service. Um, 
the way that program was constructed was to um, to effectively nationally contract major IT providers to deliver this type of cap capability and to deliver it in a um, in a sort of one size fits all method. So the, 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 the idea for the south of England, for example, is that we would have one set of clinical system suppliers that would fit into all of the hospitals, all of the GP practices, all of the um, uh, sort of community services, all of the mental health ambulance and so on and so forth. And, and that model would pervade across the piece. Of course, what happened was that just became impossible to deliver because the starting position was not a level playing field. Many of the organisations had previously invested in, um, you know, in long-term contracts for, for the supply of, of, of critical systems. And actually, to, if, if it, was, it, was a, it, was a, it was an approach that would have worked in a, on a greenfield site, but it was not an approach that was ever going to work on a, on a brownfield site. And really, what it, what it did is it delivered a number of um, elements that, that we've then built on the back of. So there are, there are pieces of this work that wouldn't have been possible without that national program. So things like um, a connection to the national index, the national spine where everybody's um, you know, demographics are collected, which is allow, you know, allows us to make sure we're joining the right people to the right people. Things like that have been um, usually helpful in delivering this piece of work. But ultimately, yeah, you're right, it didn't achieve the ambitions it, it aimed to achieve. And fundamentally, it didn't achieve them because it wasn't grown from from the locale up, it was it was a top-down you know program to deliver. Any other questions? One, if I go tap dance like that, so. <laughs> yes, is the is the is the imminent demise of Rio? I don't think. Um, Colleagues from Server Lake would be very uh, happy to hear you. So, um, so, so Rio is um, is a community system. Um, its contract runs out in October for our three community providers, which is what you're you're talking about. They will, they will move over onto another system. Um, the exact um, architecture. Can I just get back through? I promised I wouldn't put this up, but. Um, where is it? There you go. So that that the, the the way that architecture has been designed has been to cope with changes in that bottom layer. And actually, if you look at that diagram now, um, the MBT Cerner system will change at, at, at this year. Um, Western will almost certainly change within the next 18 months. Three of those four Rios will change. Um, possibly the social care systems will change as well. So the whole design has been based on the idea that organisations in time will change their clinical and, and care systems, um, but actually we still want to be able to have a shared record for everybody to benefit from that. So that's why we've designed it, you know, specifically in that way. So there's a chap there now. Um, how can I say this politely? P p p people's attitude, being candid. So what, what happens is, um, People work for the organisation that employs them, so you know it's it's natural. It's a natural behaviour. So you're employed to work for an acute trust. That's who you work for. You're employed to work for a GP practice. That's who you work for. You're employed to work for a, a mental health trust. That's who you work for. But actually, to deliver a programme like this, you've you've got to realise and remember that you work for the public and you work for the patients. And you work for the people of Bristol, and actually those people touch our system at different points. They don't only touch our system in your organization and so mentally your behavior has got to be bigger than your organization you've got to continually think it's about the patient it's about the patient wherever they are in our city wherever they are in our system um, and so that, that i think that penny has well and truly dropped in in this program actually and people get that and they behave in that way they behave bigger than their organization but i still think that is fundamentally a problem i think you know, it's a personal, you know, personal issue for me. Actually, I think too many people act and, and behave as if they work for their organisation rather than working for the the public. It's 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 accepting that you might do some work in your organisation where your organisation is not the direct beneficiary of that. So so a GP needs to accept that he or she needs to collect information that the, the hospital will be the beneficiary of. But actually, in return, they need to accept that the hospital will then do something in return, and they will benefit. And so you need that collective, um, you know, that collective attitude to, to pervade. And it do, it's, it's, it's not always there, you know, to be candid. Sorry, just before you, there's a chap at the back of his hand up.
Yeah. Okay. So, so in terms of um, in terms of the UK, well, certainly in terms of England, then I think um, Bristol's probably in the top three, four, something like that. So I would say you could look at Hampshire and the work they've done down there is quite impressive. Um, Leeds have done some quite impressive um, stuff in the in the in the north. Uh, Bradford, Cumbria, places like that are also sort of nipping at our heels, I guess, in terms of their progress. Um, I think looking slightly more wider at the UK, um, the Greater Glasgow uh, program is is pretty impressive, actually, where they've got to. They, they was they, I would certainly describe them as ahead of of, of, of Bristol at this point. Um, I think the most impressive in the in the UK footprint is the work that's been done in Northern Ireland. Um, that is a whole Northern Ireland wide um, program, which um, on one level sounds amazing, on another level you've got to remember there's only 1.8 million people in Northern Ireland, so it's not um, that super massive, but, but nevertheless they, they've, they've brought together six counties and a lot more organisations than we have to deliver it, and, and have developed a more mature record um, at that point. In terms of um, beyond that, then um, I think the, the most impressive programmes you will see on this um, are probably either in Spain or in the United States. So there's there's um, some work on Mallorca, Capsalou, um, and there's some work in Seville in Spain that is um, that is significantly more mature than anything we've got um, in the UK. And then in the um, <coughs> excuse me, in the United States, quite a number of the states have developed what are called health um, integration exchange, health information exchanges, HIEs, on a statewide kind of um, federated basis. Um, again. Uh, Slightly different drivers over there, obviously, is a very financial, you know, big commercial sector, uh, it, it health in, in the US, so it's, it's very much driven by the, um, the insurance um, uh, industry in that, in that space. But, but nevertheless, they have um, rapidly adopted a lot of this technology, and certainly the suppliers that are making hay um, in the UK, our partner on this program, as you can see, is a company called Orion Health. Um, th they are the single biggest supplier now in the US um, of HIEs, so so that's the you know that's the space to go if you want to see a really mature system. There's a chap just here first. Yeah. So um, so the question was about information governance and the and the and the barrier that creates. So. Um, um, I, I bear the scars of that. I can I can tell you quite quite candidly. So this this program began um, began about four and a half years ago on a on a napkin um, uh, over breakfast with a couple of CIOs when I drew a picture of what I thought we could we could deliver. Um, and about ten minutes after that, we began the information governance work stream. So um, because that that was by far and away going to be the the the, the, the biggest challenge, I think. Um, I would honestly say I think 90% of the IG challenge is is attitude and perception um, rather than legal reality. Um, that said, um, lots of people will throw in legal red herrings continually, and so you do have to shoot them down. So the the consent model that sits behind this is is you know pretty damn impressive, if I do say so. It, it was it was at least a year's worth of work. Um, to develop, to negotiate, um, the role-based access control for <laughs> those of the jargon friendly in the audience. That's that's the fact that um, what an A&E doctor is allowed to see is different to what a social care worker is allowed to see. Is different to what a district nurse might be allowed to see. So, so a, 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 a thing that. Um, graduates the amount of record available depending on the professional type of person accessing it. So again, the RBAC model for this um, is pretty impressive. We actually wrote, some of you may remember this or very much doubt it, um, we actually wrote to 850,000 adults um, across Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucester to tell them that we were doing this piece of work and we offered the opportunity for uh, folks to opt out. Um, we've got about a million records in there. We've had just over 2,000 um, patients opt out and about uh, 45 of those have opted back in <laughs> once they've realised what the consequence of their opting out um, was. Um, so I, I, I recognise the risk you're raising. I think um, it does take a long time to work through that. But I think the attitudinal risks around IG are far greater than the practical risks, if I can put it like that. It is much more of a convincing people journey than it is about... a you know, legal protection journey. A chap there and then I'll come to you if you like. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, um, so I'd say it's not brilliant at this stage. So it's kind of what you'd expect for a first phase um, project. I might even have it on here at some point, but I won't, I won't risk trying to find it. Um, but at the moment, it's a separate logon. So you go in, you go into, you, you enter a separate portal, you, you, you search for a patient. Um, at the point you find the patient in the, you know, in the list, you sign up your consent model, you establish your legitimate relationship with that patient, I'm allowed to access them, and then you access, a f in effect, a summary screen that includes all of the information. But for the first time, for the professionals, this will be um, GP, hospital, community, all in one place. So it'll talk about the encounters, and the encounters being all of their appointments with all of those different things. Um, so, I mean, it sounds quite basic. It is quite basic in many ways, um, but it's pretty revolutionary, to be honest, for, for, for lots of those professionals who've been used to not knowing the last time this person saw their doctor or not knowing what medication that that, or being absolutely certain what medication they were on. Um, our, um, our sort of development program also includes a whole suite of new um, kind of screen design, new functionality within that space. Um, we're really keen in to get into the idea of designing screens for, for the professional type. So have a screen that is designed for a social care professional, have a screen that's designed for A&E and so on and so forth. We've got about six of those at the moment. Um, I can imagine us having hundreds and actually as the technology develops, we'll get to a place where folks will be able to do, you know, a la Facebook and set the screen up or, you know, Google or whatever, set the, f set the screen up as you like. So, um, so I would say it's not brilliant, but it does the job. Sorry, chat here. Yeah, okay, so what, so how could we do this more rapidly, more quickly? So, um, so there's about five factors to, to make these programs successful in my view, okay? So, um, so one of those is that the source, the information exists electronically at source level. So, so part of our, our capability is limited by those, those base systems and the degree to which information is collected. So if any of you have been in hospital recently or got f um, relatives who've been in hospital, you'll recognize quite a lot of the information is still written down. Still, still paper collected. So, if, the, if if it's not electronic, that is a re that is a restrictor as to the degree to which we can create a shared records. So that's one factor. Um, th there's not really factors in terms of the integrator, but that is something you need. So that middle layer integrator piece. Um, I think wh wh where we're limited in our development in there is money. So you can imagine. Um, uh <laughs> that would be genius to know to, to attract in investment in the health services um, fr from, from, from the finance directors is a real um, full-time job of work, to be honest, these days. So um, money's a bit tight, um, <laughs> to say the least. So, so actually, we're doing this as fast as we can do it with the, with the investment that we can, um, that we can afford to make. Um, I think there is um, a limit in terms of technical capabilities. So we've got only so many developers that can only build so many interfaces at so much time. Actually attracting um, the technical resource that will come to work for NHS salaries is, um, you know, is, a, is, a, is a constant challenge. And actually, as fast as we get these people trained up, um, they're attracted out to go and work for you know, somebody for far better, um, far better reward. Um, so those are factors. And then I think the, the other um, piece that's a, an interesting issue, actually, and I sort of reflect on this quite a lot, is is what I describe as the bigger than Bristol questions. So, um, so for us to develop the patient-facing end of this, we need to have um, we need to have some way of of ensuring that the people who access that record are are are, are the people who should be accessing that record. You are you are the it is your record and you are accessing it. So we need a a citizen identity management, if you like, um, piece. So it's relatively easy for us to manage our professional user base around this, you know, and all the authentications and everything we get. But when we're starting to get into the public domain, um, that's a really tricky, tricky piece of work. And I don't think that's a question that we can solve in Bristol or even should solve in Bristol because actually, you know, frankly, if you all up and move out to somewhere else, you're going to want to be able to access your, your shared record again wherever you are. So um, part of... Um, Part of my role now is advising the national agencies on, on the development of the things that could support these pieces of work. And one of the things I'm telling them 
until um, I'm sick of hearing it myself, is that they need to help us with that citizen identity piece so that we can uh, enable this record to be shared with, with the public. Yeah. Hang on, he's got one more and I'll come to you at the back. <laughs> Sorry, I'll come to you. Yeah, so it's very, very limited. Yeah, sorry. So, um, yeah, so the question was, um, uh, what, what to, 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 to the depth of information, I guess, that is available um, within the system if it, as it currently stands, and if we were to make it, av if we were able to make it available to patients, then what might they be able to see? So, I think there was a slide in there that starts to describe this is the type of information that's that's in there. It's relatively limited. What 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 we've done within this program is. Um, in many ways, when you go back to those 17 organisations, it's been it's been an exercise in establishing trust between the, between the organisations. So where we've had um, clinical professionals or care professionals who've been nervous about sharing bits of information, we've tended to not push that too hard. Um, we've sort of said, well, okay, we'll just share you know these three items or these six items or these ten bits of information. Um, and what we've seen happen really over the last year is that this sharing has now become the new norm. It's become normal that this stuff is shared. And so we're beginning to push and say, well, what about if, if you're comfortable with sharing those three, what about sharing these five on top or these four on top? And so we're starting to get a richer record um, th th as a result of, um, of, of you know, sharing that information. But you can imagine, um, well, maybe you can't, the, the, the starting point for this was GPs who considered the information in their GP system to belong to them. You know, so, so it's comedic, isn't it, as a, as a member of the public? You sort of think, hang on a minute, surely that's mine. Um, but actually, they, they, they believed it was theirs, and therefore sharing it was quite a brave thing for them to do, and they'd be quite um, nervous about doing that. So we, we wouldn't overly push it. We would just ask for the, for the minimum we felt we could get away with. Um, but in time, that will get richer and richer and richer, you know, as that trust grows. There's a chap at the back had got a hand up. Yep. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 it's quite, um, so I think it's certainly there, and I think more, more interestingly, this is again another the bigger than Bristol opportunity for, for, the, for the innovative entrepreneur um, to, to, to sort of get involved in this type of work. So um, nationally, that, the national program you, you asked me about right at the very beginning has been replaced by um, more of a national strategy. That's, that national strategy is, is very much about um, embracing the kind of app development world, um, about embracing the open source um, technologists, um, about breaking away from the stranglehold that um, proprietary software uh, vendors have got on 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 health and social care. So um, I think we're in we're in the early stages of that moment, but I do think this is a, this is um, uh, health and social care finally shaking off the shackles that have that have restricted some of the technology development for, for a long time. So I think you, you kind of watch this space, you'll see announcements through the summer on some of the roadmaps and things like that at a national level that will be, you know, if, you've, if you're innovate, you know, in one of those kind of SMEs that are looking to innovate, you, you'll have opportunities. I would, I, I, yes, and I think it's, um, <coughs> yes, it's ex exactly, it's the doors, the doors are joined, not fully open, but it's, 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 it's swinging open, I think I'd probably say. So it's not—it's not waiting for somebody to push it. It is, you know, it is—it is happening. And things like the development of G Cloud and the frameworks like that are, are, you know, real examples of of the NHS trying to get much slicker about the way it buys this thing or allows that vendor community to 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 sell to the health service. So there's a chap in front with the glasses. You've just got. I will do. Yeah, I've got. I've had far more than my time. I'm going to have to double my fee. <laughs> Am I getting a fee, David? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So 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 you're really talking about two way flow of this of this information, yeah. Okay, so um 
So all of the capability to do two-way flow it exists within that, that architecture. So all those CDRs, all the IE, all of that has got two-way flows. Again, this is this trust. This is a kind of maturity of the trust piece for individuals. So at what point does a GP trust the system to allow a hospital data to, auto, you know, to drop all the way back into their record um, or into their, you know, into their document store, into their internet, whatever it might be. So, so the capability has been designed into the specification. All the software's got that ability to do all of that. Um, there are elements of the next stage of design, particularly around discharge summaries from hospital and things like that, that will flow and they will begin to be the beginnings of that two-way flow of information. Again, I think in a year, I'll be talking about some of that being reality. In three years, that will be, um, you know, that it, it will be one, you know, effectively shared record um, access. The other, the other, the other point of that that's quite interesting in this piece. I know I'm killing my time now, but is that is that we're enabling the access to the shared record from those native systems. So w one of the things that c that sort of kills it a little bit is the fact you have to separately log on and access it um, outside. You know, within within 12 months, you'll be able to just get the record as if it was part of your native system. So again, we we're expecting that to to grow the development. All right, I think I'm done. I'm done, good. <laughs>